Okay, uh, my talk is called No Nuggets, N not because it's almost lunchtime, but, but well, it, it's a good fit. And well, the first thing I wanted to do is, is talk about, about me and my, my relationship with, with Godot. Uh, I've done that earlier, but just for the records, I started using and contributing to Godot almost a, a year ago. I'm, I'm developing, developing a, a game and with it, obviously, and I hope to be releasing it in, in a few months. That's my, my nickname in, in, on GitHub in the, for the contributions, and, and that's my nickname. My my avatar. Okay, and that's the the address of a, a development blog. I I'm about to start. The address is already created, so please take note. And mm, in the following days, I will be uh, setting it up and start uh, adding content about Godot probably about uh, overall game design and, and everything I, I find to be useful for everyone. Well, ab about this, this talk, mm, three main intentions. The, the first one, try to show interesting stuff I, I found in, in, on my way with, with Godot and during the development of, of my game, as interesting as possible. Uh, you, you'll, tell me, you'll tell me later if you have found it interesting or not. Warn about some traps I, I found and I've fallen in, so you you can skip them. And, and just to provide some fun talking about our favorite game engine. Well, mm, this is called Node Nuggets because it's composed of some nuggets. The first one, uh, ju just a, a, a quickie, a, a warm up. Um, this, this was a, a feature that was added uh, on one of the, of the most recent releases. And, and I'll show it with a, with a sample. Well, uh, sometimes you might find you need to align some nodes on, on a straight line. And you select all them. And, and try to, um, to do a, a multi-node edit to align them all. But when you hit enter, both coordinates are changed. Well, the, the feature I was talking about is the is one that make you able to just to just change one coordinate, and this works for for matrices, two D and three D vectors, and almost every every basic math type. Instead of of hitting enter, you press shift plus enter, in having focused the field you want to apply to them all. So this way you get them aligned. And, and it, it's, it's not a very big feature, but um, can save some frustration sometimes. OK, the, the next one. Well, as you might already know, GD script is not per se garbage collected. But a lot of classes derive from reference, which, is, which means they are reference counted. So when no one is referencing them, they are automatically freed. 
but this th doesn't apply to nodes and, and any subclass of them. So uh, a mistake I, I was committing and it was to it don't, don't do the, the right thing to free them. Well, this is a, a boiled down version of the of all the Godot object system inheritance tree. You you have in one hand reference and the other hand nodes. Uh, nodes, you have all canvas item, every everything in 2D stuff and spatial, um, more or less everything on 3D. And references are are mainly used in in resources. Audio samples, me meshes, sprites, well, more than sprites, uh, textures, and so on. So the, the, the moral of the story is, is you don't uh, freeing, freeing your nodes we, by removing them from its parent won't make them disappear from memory. You, you should always get rid of them we we free of Q free, and I'll I'll demonstrate what happens when you don't do the the right thing. Well, I I have a sprite here. Uh, the, this computer is pretty slow. Okay. Well, I, if I just remove it, the, this uh, calls. Mm, this calls the um, remove child to remove it from its parent. This is what what we get Be before removing it. The the reported object count uh, by the performance class is the same as after the, the moment we, we have thought we have removed it. So uh, that node is somewhere in memory, but it's not reachable, and it's uh, wasting memory. Instead, if we, if we call on it free or queue free, it, it will be effectively destroyed. Well, the next one. Sometimes you want your, your code to, to capture the screen for doing some kind of post-processing or applying it as a texture. And, and Viewport provides an APA, APA for, for doing that. The, what you have to do is a two-step thing. You queue the screen capture, so the visual server uh, get awareness of what you you intend, and later on, you you have to call get a screen capture to retrieve it. The the official and documented approach. Th this is quoted from the docs. It says that you might need to to check more than one frame until the the right image is returned. Well, even in the official example, uh, they they wait for two frames to be processed before retrieving the the frame. Well, I I found an, another way, which is be, between the queuing the capture and retrieving it, calling right a visual server draw. That that makes the visual server render a frame. And also, it flashes the, the query. This has one benefit, which is a, a simpler flow. Uh, you, you don't need to, to yield. Uh, we'll talk more about yield in, in, in a forthcoming nugget, but um, if you, you are inside a flow, you think, uh, uh, a sequence of things are happening one after the other, but you start yielding uh, other nodes 
may, may, may make some things, emit signals, um, and more or less um, break what I what I thought will, it would happen. The a downside also with this approach is that you, you are rendering a frame in, inside uh, the processing of a frame. So, uh, and that, that takes time, depending on, on the, the game, but it takes some time that will affect timing. So, um, you might get uh, some stutter or, or hiccup for only one frame, but if that's not what you want, you, you won't, you, you, you will not want to, to take this, this approach. In any other case, I, I find it to be, to be easier. Well, I promise I, will, I would be taking about yield. Well, a yield, uh, as, as a reminder, um, can be used in, in two ways. If you call it with, with no argu arguments, uh, the, the method it, it's called from will stop its execution and, and return a, an object. You can call the resume method on later to resume its execution. And if you call with, with two arguments, you, you pass an, an object and the name of a signal, you expect it to be emitting later, the, the yield uh, will be in effect until, until that, that object emits that signal. Well, uh, this seems pretty simple, but there are some traps. M mainly two. The first one, yield is, is not recursive, it, it only uh, rolls back the, the last method, or mm, more sim simpler. It returns from the, the very same method it's called in. So if you are encapsulating some functionality involving yield in, in a method you use in different places, uh, you can get surprised by the, by the fact that uh, the, you will only be interrupting the, this disencapsulated functionality in, instead of the, the overall flow. And, and the other one, it is not re retroactive. This seems obvious. Mm, for example, with, with signals, uh, it's obvious that before the, the call to yield, uh, has been processed, uh, the, the yield itself will, will not be in effect. Uh, and if the, if the signal you, you expect to get is, is emitted before, um, then it, it will yield forever or, or until that signal is, is emitted again. This seems uh, pretty obvious, but in the, in the demonstration later, I'll try to show a case in which um, it's not so so obvious and and maybe a source of um, hard to debug bugs. Well, uh, I, as you may know, a, a game engine uh, which does basically is is repeating some pattern of code on, on and on and until the game exits. Well, I, I, I've tried to, to research a bit in the, in the code uh, how is that exactly done in Godot. Well, for, for every frame, first if, if processes the, the fixed stuff, we'll delve a bit deeper on, on, on it later. Then all the idle, all the idle stuff, stuff. Then it processes audio, so the audio server can do its 
its business, uh, mixing, uh, and so on. And, and then the, the visual server is, is called to, to, to render. Well, that's, that happens in, indefinitely. Well, you, you can define it if, if you exit the game. But if not, it, it would happen endlessly until the, the end of the time. Well, the fixed step can happen more than once in, in, a, in a given frame. That's uh, because the, the engine uh, tries to, to, be, um, to, to be as accurate as possible uh, honoring the, the target FPS you, you have set up. So this is one form of frame skipping. And by, by the way, the, the engine has a, a hard-coded limit of eight uh, fixed step frames before uh, skipping that, that small loop and, and doing the rest. So uh, if the, the game is, is getting very slow because the, the device is slow or it's processing a lot, from some point it starts getting slower. It, it's no longer real time, but it gives a, a good compromise between, between a frame rate and, and responsiveness. And uh, after or or before, not not sure, but uh, the the input is processed. That's the the time the operating system has the chance to to report to the engine all, all the input events, mouse, joystick, etc. Well, let let's do some. Well, during the fixed step, knowing this uh, is, isn't necessary to, to use the engine. But from time to time, um, you wish you, you have known this because you have a greater control over what the game is doing and when exactly sound callbacks or signals uh, are produced. So during the fixed step, you get the, the physics callbacks. Uh, if you are using your custom force integrator, you, you get um, you get uh, body body enter, body exit, area enter, all that family of of notification. Then, if, if something has changed, it, it's transformed and and has requested requested to be notified. You'll get it here. Then uh, the fixed frame signal will be emitted. You can use it for whatever you want, but it's nice to know th this is the, the exact moment it's emitted. Then the, the unique group, group calls. So uh, when you have used call group with a, with a flag for, um, for the signal to to not be emitted multiple times uh, for that object during that frame, then you you get here the you get here them. Then more more chance of, of getting notifications of about a transfer change. And and then a fixed process is called on on your nodes. The, this is the the time when when you do uh, your nodes. Mainly reactions to, to physics or, or things that, that must happen in a in a fixed uh, time. Then, if if you have called Q delete on, on some nodes, this is the the time they are disposed. Then the the message Q is flashed. The, this message Q. Q is a, an internal data structure the, the engine uses to, 
for for different uh, different uh, signals and everything that that gets that has the word deferred on it, uh, because in in the docs uh, in some places you you can read uh, you can defer this uh, this will be processed in in deferred time and you might be wondering what that means. Well, that uh, that means that 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 mm, it will be done here and then the the physics st step but but that's only pertaining to the engine itself here, here e, the the physics server does its job well the, the idle step this will will be much much shorter because the it's it's almost the same you get here the, the idle signal. If you want to do something per, per visual frame instead, instead of um, fixed frame, you have the chance to do it there. And transfer chain notifications again. Process is the, the idle process or uh, is called in your, in your notes. Uh, again, a unique group calls uh, are flashed here. M more change notifications if some transfer has been changed in the in the former steps. Uh, visibility notifications. The, uh, if you have uh, requested to be notified about the, the visibility status of, of a node, uh, by using visibility of notifiers for 2D or 3D, you, you get them in this precise time. The delayed queue is flashed again this time. And the message queue as well. So you, here is another chance of getting deferred, deferred step. Well, the, the next one. Uh, this is um, uh, something you, you might need to do. And it's about uh, pre-compiling shaders. Because uh, the compilation of, of shaders uh, is performed at, at runtime. Or at, at first use, when, for, for instance, uh, and a sprite with, with a shader that hasn't been used uh, still uh, enters, enters the viewport. The, the visual server, the rasterizer, no, notice, notices it and, and does the, the compilations. Or if the conditionals for that shader has changed. Well, a conditionals is something users usually don't, don't need to worry about, mm, but mm, to, to name the most important, it, it would be if, uh, whether the node is, is being lit or not. For instance, in, in, the, in 2D, when, when a sprite en enters the, the area of a 2D light, its, its light shader needs to be compiled. So, although you have precompiled the the vertex and the fragment shader, um, you you can get some trouble here again. Not not actually uh, trouble, but the thing is that compilation can get some time, uh, especially on on mobile, and especially if the sh if the shader is complex and a not noticeable hiccup. Can can happen. In in my game, that that happened when, for instance, uh, an explosion with a shader yet unknown to the rasterizer uh, and entered this the scene, um, and and I it, it was pretty noticeable. The the timing was a, a bit disrupted. And how how to avoid this? Well, on the scene setup, when when you don't uh, aren't worrying too much about timing, you you need to to precompile them. 
well, uh, you need to take in account, into account the, the conditional. So if, if you know uh, a certain, certain shader will be used both lighting and without it, uh, you, you, will, you will need to, to, to make sure the, the three vertex fragment and, and lighting shaders are, are compiled. Well, that's something I've already told you. In, in, the, in the demonstration, I'll try to, to show it. So this isn't too theoretical. And the, the last one, this, this is uh, very, very quick. And, and for this, I haven't had time to, to set up a demonstration. Uh, th this topic will, w would deserve it, its own talk because it's mm, a very, it's, it's vast, a vast topic. But just some, some quick tips. Uh, some uh, little things I, I would have wanted to know. For example, uh, well, uh, this is mostly for 2D, which is the, the area of the engine I most experienced, but probably most, most of it or, or everything is, is applicable for 3D as well. Well, when, when you are creating animations for, for a, a character, especially a, a complex character uh, made up from different parts, it's a very good thing to define a, a rest a pose animation, which, which is no more than an animation with 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 the init initial with uh, with keyframes that store the, the initial or the state of, of every node. Uh, for a character, it would be just the, the its standing position with with neutral angles and positions for everything. Well, and, and as well, if, if while you are creating other animations, you get things messed up, the rest position al allows you to, to go back and, and restart with, without having to, to recreate by hand from scratch the, the rest pose. Uh, the next tip is in, ensure you, you are in control. Well, uh, the animation player Mm, does it job w uh, on its process notification? The, the thing is that, depending on how you load the scene or add the node, you, uh, it might not have time to do it before the frame is rendered. So even if an autoplay animation uh, has been set up, uh, on the first frame, you will get the the state, the last state you the the animation or, or the notes, the affected notes had uh, when you save the scene, and that might last only for a few milliseconds, but but you can notice it, and it's not it's a bit ugly, and for fixing that, you can call on in the ready callback. Uh, update uh, with zero time and true for a forcing update. The, that way you, you are sure the, the first frame of the, uh, uh, the default animation or the autoplay auto animation uh, will, will be in, in effect on when, when the rasterizer renders the next, the next frame. And sometimes you, you need to post-process the animation. For, for instance, uh, you might have a default walk animation, but you wanted the, the, the legs and the feet of your character to, to adapt to the, to the ground, to the slopes, uh, et cetera. And you, you might decide to, to do some procedural post-processing by, by code. Mm, well, if, if you want to do that, it's a very good thing to, well, more, more than a very good thing, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's the thing to do. 
put that post-processing code in, in a node, it, it can be perfectly uh, a, a node a dimension agnostic, uh, just the, the, node, the node class, after the, the relevant animation player. Uh, as you might know, the, the nodes are processed in tree order, so that way you, you ensure uh, your post-processing code uh, will be run after the animation player does it, its job. I, I play with, with another ways of doing this, like, um, like adding the, the code to the uh, animation player script itself, um, but the results um, weren't, weren't as, as good. Uh, and not, not, not every time you, you got what, what you expected. Maybe I was doing something wrong, but, but this, this way of doing it, a, a, a separate node for, for the post-processing, um, so far has, has proven to be rock solid. And the, the last tip. If you want to post-process animations, you will be touching may, maybe positions or rotations. And the, the, simpler, the simplest way of, of doing this is, is in a, a stateless way. I, I mean, um, for every frame, having the, the animation player update the animation, but the whole animation so it, the, the end result of that work done by the animation player is the same as if you hadn't uh, added any post-processing code. So on every frame, your post-processing code knows uh, it, it, it starts working uh, with, a, with a normal frame with no with no, without getting the, the results of post processing accumulated, that that could be pretty hard to handle. And and now I I will run the the demonstrations in Godot itself. So uh, some some stuff discussed here w will become much more clear. Well, regarding the alternative way of, of capturing a screen, well, I have a button that performs the, the official and documented way with, with thus the same as the, as the example, uh, which is yielding for two frames, and my way, which is a calling visual server. The screen capture will, will appear on the bottom right corner. Well, using the official approach, it appears. And this is a, a proof that my, that my way works too. You hit the other button and, and you get a new, a new capture perfectly valid, uh, as with the other approach. With no frame delay. The same frame that you get in the capture? Yeah. Or the next one? The, the same frame or the... Your alternative method, you get the same frame? Uh, you, you still get the, the next one. Be two next. No, not two next. Yeah, just the, the next. The next one, the immediately next. More uh, closer to reality. Mm, yes, the, you could put it that way. Well, the, the shader pre-compilation demo um, with this computer and, and all this luck uh, will be impossible to, to show now, uh, but anyway, uh, in, during the afternoon, I, I can show it to you on, on another computer or... 
or on the same computer, but without the video sharing stuff on. The, the only thing I would like to say is that uh, I, I haven't told uh, yet how to, how to do the pre-compilation. Well, you just need to, to set up a, a frame with, with all the, with uses all the shaders you need to, to pre-compile. For instance, you can add sprites or, or polygons. That, that is for 2D, but for 3D, you would uh, add meshes or, or ma manual rendering commands. Mm, what, what you need to do is, is get in the, the engine to, to do any, any rasterization uh, using the, the shaders you need to get precompiled. So when they are used uh, during game time, you, you won't get that, that stutter. And this is the, the last one. The, the stuff about, about yield, well, we, we have two, two characters here. The one at the left is the, is the hero, the one at the right is the, the enemy. And we have a, a button for firing that, that white kind of, of bullet. Uh, what we are trying to do is that uh, when the, the bullet hits the enemy, the, the hero celebrates it but by changing its color. Well, as, as you have seen, it has changed its color uh, just after, after the, the shot, not, not when the bullet has hit the enemy. That's because we incorrectly assumed Well, we, we wanted, uh, we tried to, to do it this way. On, on ballet shot, the, uh, the, this is called when you hit the button. We effectively call, called a, a method for waiting until the enemy is dead. And then celebrate. And in the wait until enemy is dead uh, method, we tried to yield on, uh, until the enemy em, uh, emits the, the dead signal. The enemy script uh, does that when the coordinate of the ballet is, is very close. That's not the point. The, the point is uh, this hasn't worked. And this hasn't worked because uh, yield is, is not recursive. So this call to yield skips the, the rest of this method and goes back to the, to the point uh, that method where was called. So it goes right to, to celebrate. So it's celebrating the, the kill before it has happened. To, to fix that, Uh, well, uh, this is, this is uh, because. Uh, okay, to, to fix that, we need to. We have needed to put the yield in the first method instead. So, uh, this thing of encapsulating the, the weight stuff in, in another method uh, hasn't work, worked here. And in, if we instead ha, had put the, the yield in this other method, uh, everything would, would, ha, would have worked as intended. Let's fire. Well, uh, due to the lag, it, it has almost <laughs> Been unseen, but for for those of you with with uh, fa fast eyes,
it, it's a damn slow, but but I can I can promise it it works if it works this way. And the other the other gotcha about yield was that is it's not retroactive. Well, it, it's it looks as something pretty obvious. Well, uh, both both chapters here uh, use the, the same script. It's more or less uh, to to fulfill a, a, a contract. So we are we uh, we expect that when we call its animate method, if they find an animation player as as a child, they will play its animation called animation. And after that happens, uh, it will emit the animation finished signal. Well, we, we have a, a button for for each of the of the characters. Each button uh, does the, this uh, this stuff of calling animate on one character or, or the other. Well, we we expect the the we we change the background color to red. We we get one of both characters depending on on this number, one or two. Mm. Then we call that animate me method, and we try to yield until the character emits its animation finished signal. And only then we uh, reset the, the background color to the uh, original. Well, le let's see what happens. Well, it, it's not sure we, <laughs> we will see it, but I'll try to, to explain it. Well, the, the first character effectively has an animation player. The second character doesn't. Um, our, our design idea is that if uh, any character doesn't have an animation player, it just uh, emits the, the signal when we request it to animate, because uh, we, we expect we always get that signal, for instance, and, and we have uh, written the code we, with that in mind. Well, when we hit animate on the first one, the, the background turns red, the character that does a, a little animation with some rotation, it, it dances uh, as in a good way, in, in the best way he knows. And, and when the animation has finished, the, the background color is reset. Well, uh, let's try on the on the other character. The background become, becomes red forever. The the yield ne never never ends. The the animation finished signal or or is never emitted, but that uh, can be because uh, in the script. Uh, we have tried to to make sure about it. If if the animation player, if so, in the in the else block, that happens when the, when it has no animation player, it emits the signal. So in in, in principle, uh, everything looks okay. If if there's animation, an animation player, the we. We call play, and the animation then plays. And we uh, connect the animation player finished signal to, to the character 
emit signal method. Well, uh, this is a bit co convoluted, but but just is is a way of of uh, of saving writing one method. Just, just um, making that when the, the animation player finishes, the animation finished signal is emitted. Well, this this is the one that has worked. But the other one that that also seems simpler hasn't. What what's the what's the the reason? The the reason is that the signal is emitted in immediately when after we have called. Let's after we have called animate, and the yield comes later. And yield it is not retroactive. Uh, it it couldn't be. It, it doesn't need to be. Um, I I I fall in in this trap, and until I noticed what was happening, because in some cases it was working and in others it weren't. Um, it it took me some some time to debug it. The the fix. For this stuff is in, instead of of emitting the signal right now, more more or less as a rule of thumb, de deferring it. Uh, due to my my decomposition of the of the loop of the engine, uh, you already know when that will be called, at when the message queue uh, is, is flashed. Type on the signal name. Uh, emit signal. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. OK, this, this way. The, the yield will would have the, the chance of start waiting for the signal before it is effectively emitted. Well, by, by using call deferred, the, the signal is, is not emitted right at this point, but later. And even if we didn't know exactly when, um, we know for sure that it will not be just here. At, at least the, this code and, and every code in, in the stack uh, will, will finish its, its execution before that happens. So the, this time, Well, uh, th this is what what has to happen. The the background turns red, but we we get the the signal very very soon, and and then we we reset the background color. So um, uh, apparently, and nothing happens. But that's what should happen. <laughs> well, that, that's all. <laughs> and <laughs> hey, th th thank you very much. And now, we, if you have any, any question, uh, you can make it now or or in the afternoon, in, as, as you like. I think everybody is hungry, yeah? Hello, I'm talking through a cube. So uh, my question is how, in general, did you find the, the engine uh, for, for making the game in the sense that 
probably some things uh, uh, could be easier or more user friendly or in that sense I mean what, what would you like uh, as you have the, the experience of making a, a game like what, what would you think that you would like probably uh, make it easier or or just improve so the experience flows smoother or something like that okay uh... Well, the, the only thing that comes to my mind is the... It's not a, a feature that needs to be improved, but a, a small family of, of bugs about the scene inheritance. Mm, yeah. I, I would need to, to be able to, to trust a scene inheritance and, and know uh, perfectly the, the philosophy about uh, over, overriding property values and how, how all that is affected by the, how, um, how many scenes or not how many, which scenes I have I opened in the, in the editor. I, I don't know if, if I have opened the parent of an uh, inherited scene uh, how that uh, affects the the file when when it's saved, um, and being having a, a more clear uh, knowledge about that that workflow, and and finally getting completely rid of of those little bugs that still are present. But uh, overall, I, I find I find the engine uh, pretty pretty intuitive and almost uh, everything is is nice working with it. Okay. Anyone? Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. And don't forget to bookmark that address. <laughs>